We are looking at Exodus chapter 7 today. And we're actually covering several chapters as the story of the Exodus now speeds up. We're also speeding up in our coverage of it. And we're not going to read the entire four chapters as we start today, but I will read the first seven verses of Exodus 7, and they will appear on the screen behind me as well, so you can follow along. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for raising up Moses and Aaron. Thank you for raising up your prophets throughout, throughout history. Thank you for raising up your apostles. Thank you for raising up the people who shared your gospel with us the first time we heard it. And we thank you for this word which is before us now. We pray that you would, by your spirit, illuminate our hearts and minds to understand well what you want to speak to us in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this passage of scripture is one of those, uh, it's one of those turning points as an expository preacher where I have to decide, am I going to take each of the plagues on Egypt and turn it into one sermon? In which case, well, we would be in this, in this account for, for three months. Um, and frankly, each sermon would be a little bit repetitive, right? Because it's kind of each plague follows the same pattern uh, a little bit. So we could do it that way or try to put it all into, into one sermon, in which case we would be here for three hours. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to find a way to cover these four chapters. And, and these four chapters cover the first nine plagues on Egypt. And we're going to try to do it in a timely way. Um, but do it in a thorough way as well. And so as we go through these, ch these chapters, we're going to be reading selections uh, about each plague as we go forward and trying to see the big picture of what God is doing in Egypt. We're going to learn to, I hope, delight in God's glory as he puts it on display in Egypt. And to get at our idea that we're going to be taking out of these chapters this morning, I want to begin by, by telling you about uh, an idea that was first put forward by a, name, a man named Abraham Maslow in 1943 in an article that he published entitled A Theory of Human Motivation, which posited a hierarchy of needs that he believed helped explain the way people make decisions. Usually in behavioral psychology, it's presented in the form of a pyramid like this. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And as you, you may have seen this, as you look at the bottom few tiers, it's considered that those are the things that people have to attend to first in their lives in order to be able to even think about the things higher up in the pyramid. So you have to have your physiological needs and safety needs met before you can even begin to think about being creative and, and things like that, right? This is a pretty, pretty common way of presenting this hierarchy of needs. But as we think about it, and as we view it through the lens of scripture, I think we can realize that Maslow's missing something. There's one need that's even more basic than physiological and safety needs, and we could present it like this. Spiritual needs, right? The Bible tells us that there is a need that's even more foundational than our physiological need. It's our spiritual need. It's our need to recognize God as the God of glory. Or we could put it in these terms, the creature's need for the creator's glory. And I think from the scriptural perspective, we can argue that we have to have these, that need met before we can attend to any other needs, or at least before any of those other needs have any value for us. That's what we're going to be seeing as we look at these four chapters of Exodus this morning, that the one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. The one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. 
We're going to be talking this morning about God's glory. We're going to see God's glory put on display in these plagues against Egypt. We're going to talk about how Pharaoh ignored God's glory and the danger of ignoring God's glory. And then we're going to talk about the joy that comes when we learn to delight in God's glory. The one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. Just by way of review, as we get into Exodus 7, 8, 9, and 10 this morning, we remember that God has visited his people and announced his intention of redeeming them from slavery in Egypt. After an initial encounter the last week or two, we saw how Pharaoh not only rejected God's demands, but has increased the Israelites' workload in response and, and increased their misery as a result. And everyone, by the end of chapter 6, is disheartened. The Israelites are disheartened because they feel they haven't been saved at all. Their work is even harder than it was before. They think they're going to be destroyed there in the land of Egypt rather than being delivered. Moses and Aaron are disheartened because they haven't seen God fulfill the promise that he made yet. They don't understand how he's going to. And yet God explains all of this in terms of it being his purpose to demonstrate his power and his glory, both to the Israelites and to the Egyptians and indeed to the rest of the world. That's what he says in the opening verses of chapter 7, as we just read. I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. This is God's purpose. The one thing that we need most in the world, the one thing that every person needs most in the world, is to know and delight in the glory of God. Let's see how God's glory is put on display in God's acts against Egypt. He announces his purpose here to make sure the Egyptians and the Israelites and by extension all the world would know that he is the Lord, would know his power and glory. And by the way, as he goes forward through these four chapters, he states that intention several different times. So if you, for example, glance ahead to Exodus chapter 9, you see him saying much the same thing. Look at that. Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 and following. We, we read these words. The Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. This is why God acts in the way he does. So when we read the story of the plagues, we're not supposed to read them as though God is just kind of throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. He's not just saying, well, if that didn't work, maybe this will. If that doesn't work, maybe this will. And finally, he, he, he's able to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. That's not how we're supposed to read the story of the plagues. Rather, when we read the story of the plagues on Egypt, we are to understand them through this lens. God is showing his power and his glory so that all the earth will know that there is no one like him in all the earth. The plagues on Egypt show God's power and his glory. And in particular, they show his power and his glory over the imaginary deities of Egypt. And so if you've ever studied the plagues before, if you've been in sermon series on the plagues before, you might know this, that the plagues are not just random acts, although sometimes when you read them, they appear a little bit arbitrary, but rather they are very specific acts designed either to humiliate or to demonstrate God's power over the deities of Egypt. So for example, we can read Exodus 7, 8 and following, and we see the first plague. Look what happens in Exodus 7, 8 and following. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men, the sorcerers, and they and the magicians, or the magi of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. Each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to Pharaoh, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood, and the fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. It is a severe curse. It's the first of the plagues on Egypt, the turning of the Nile River into blood. And you have to understand, of course, that for the Egyptians, the Nile River was semi-divine in its own right. They had gods and goddesses associated with the Nile River. One of the gods that was associated with the Nile River was the god Happy, which sounds like a joyful name to us, but it is a name that had a curse associated with it for the the Israelites. Happy is considered the water bearer of the Egyptian gods. Not a water bearer in the sense of being a servant. That's how we use the term water bearer. But a water bearer in the sense that he was the source of life. The water of the Nile was the source of life. Every year the Nile River overflowed its banks. And and when it receded from the banks, the the land there was then fertile. And that's how they were able to grow their crops. And that's how Egypt was was able to become a great economic center and military power. The Nile itself was considered divine. Some Egyptian mythologies called it the blood of Osiris. And And this Nile was the source of life for them. And yet, when God strikes it, it becomes a source of death, doesn't it? It becomes blood, and the the fish in the Nile die, and it stinks. And, and And the stated purpose is that the Egyptians become weary of drinking water from the Nile. Isn't that interesting? That which had been a source of joy and life to them becomes a source of weariness and death. You see, God is demonstrating his power over the gods of the Egyptians. But what does this do? Well, look at what what happens. Moses and Aaron did all of this as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of the servants. He lifted up his staff and struck the water in the Nile and all the water in the Nile turned into blood and the fish in the Nile died, right? And then in verse 22, it says, the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. And so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. He did not listen to them. His heart was hardened, and he wouldn't listen. And so we, we reach the second plague. And if you, if you skip down a little bit to chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, we read about the second plague on Egypt. This is one of those that, if you don't know better, seems just arbitrary, almost humorous, right? Look at it. The Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all of your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. Frogs. Now again, we read this and we go, that's kind of funny. It's kind of an amusing thing. Or at worst, it was a nuisance for the Egyptians, and certainly it would have been a nuisance, right? As we, you know, we try to think about it realistically, frogs everywhere, frogs getting in the way of everything. But even as we think about the great annoyance and nuisance of it, we still, there's, there's something in us that goes, it's kind of funny, right? It's kind of funny with frogs everywhere. But it wasn't at all funny to the Egyptians. You have to remember, again, all of these things connect with their own mythologies, their own pantheon, their gods and goddesses. So one of the, one of the other gods that the Egyptians worshipped was a goddess named Heket who often took the form of a frog. She came up out of the Nile. She was a consort of Happy, the god we just talked about. They were associated with the Nile, and they came up out of the Nile. They're associated with frogs. Even to this day, you can find statuary in Egypt depicting frogs. They were signs of fertility because the Nile gave fertility to the land. And so God is is saying, in essence, to the Egyptians, you like these frogs so much, I'll make you sick of them. I'll give you your fill of frogs. But does this do anything for Pharaoh? Look at verse 15 of chapter 8. When Pharaoh saw that there was a respite from that plague, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And this becomes the pattern as we go forward through these plagues, right? 
plague after plague strikes, and, and sometimes Pharaoh uh, has changes of heart, but they always go back, and eventually he hardens his heart, his heart is hardened, and he recants any decision he had made, and he won't let the people of Israel go. And so we reach the third plague on Egypt. Look at chapter 8, verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. Some of your translations may say lice or fleas. But it kind of doesn't really matter what exactly it became. The point is not what the dust became. The point is that Moses, as he enacts this plague, strikes the dust. He strikes the dirt. He strikes the soil. This is God demonstrating his power over the very earth of Egypt. You notice in none of these other plagues other than the, the plague on the Nile River does it say Moses struck something in particular. But here he strikes the dirt. He strikes the dust. The Egyptians worshipped a god called Seb, who was the god of the earth, the god of the soil, the god of the dirt. And it is not without reason that God tells Moses, strike the dirt. Show my power over this dirt, this dust that the Egyptians put so much stock in. And still, as it goes forward, it doesn't change anything for Pharaoh. Although, interestingly, although Pharaoh's magicians had been able to mimic most of Moses' plagues before, now they aren't able to mimic this one. So if you glance down to 8.19, it says, The magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Which takes us to the fourth plague. Chapter 8, verse 20. It says, the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. The Egyptians worshipped a goddess known as Uachit who is the goddess of the flies. Do you see what God's doing? These are not arbitrary signs or plagues. This is God over and over demonstrating to the Egyptians and to the Israelites and to all the rest of the world that the gods and goddesses that the Egyptians worshipped are nothing. They have no power. He has all power over them. But Pharaoh and his people don't seem to get the lesson. Not entirely. In verse 25 of chapter 8, we read, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but... Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. The fifth plague we read about in chapter 9. The Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. As you might imagine, the Egyptians had several deities, several gods and goddesses associated with protecting their cattle, their herds, their livestock. They worshipped gods like Ptah and Hethor and Nevis and Ammon, all gods and goddesses associated with cattle and livestock. But there was one god in particular that they always associated with the protection of livestock, and he was usually depicted in the form of a bull. 
In fact, to this day, you can find the Apis bull represented in, in uh, Egyptian archaeology. In fact, if you go down to the Cleveland Art Museum, you'll find in the Egypt section, you'll find representations that they found in Egypt of the Apis bull. He's a hugely important figure in Egyptian mythology. And if you pause and think about it, you'll realize that this isn't the last time in Israel's history where, we'll, where we will see this Apis bull come into play. And so God, as he, as he strikes down the livestock of the Egyptians, shows that even this God and all the other gods and goddesses associated with the protection of the Egyptians' livestock cannot stand up to him. He is powerful. His glory is powerful. And yet, what effect does this have? At the, end of chapter seven, at the end of verse 7 of chapter 9, we read, The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. The sixth plague. Exodus 9, 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln. Let Moses throw them in the air inside of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. The Egyptians worshipped Serapis and Imhotep, who were gods and goddesses associated with healing and yet even the magicians, the magi of Egypt, who would have known exactly, supposedly, how to appease these gods and goddesses of healing, could not heal themselves of the boils that came upon them. Do you see the lesson that God is teaching the Egyptians and the Israelites who had grown up in that culture? But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Consider the seventh plague, the plague of hail, as it's reported to us in verses 22 and following. Look at 9.22. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, so that there may be hail in the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, and there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as has never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field. In all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Egypt, just as it had many gods and goddesses to protect its flocks and herds, had gods and goddesses that were, in their minds, designed to, to protect their crops and to protect them from the eventualities of storms. They worshipped, for example, a god named Nut and Shu, these were gods and goddesses of the sky and the atmosphere. Isis was also a god in charge of the atmosphere and crops. And yet, no doubt, as they prayed to these gods and goddesses to relieve them of the hail and the thunder and the storm and the fire that ran down in the hail, their gods and their goddesses were silent. Because they're imaginary. They, they're not real. They don't exist. God is the one true God in charge of all of these things. The eighth plague we read about in chapter 10. The Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Again, this is God's purpose to teach the Egyptians, to teach the Israelites who he is. They will worship him. Skipping down to verse 12 of this chapter, we read about this, this plague. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. And Moses did so. 
and the locusts came on the land, and they ate everything that the hail had left. God is dealing a blow now against one of the chief gods of the Egyptian pantheon, Set, the God who is in charge of the fertility of the crops. He couldn't protect the Egyptian crops from the locusts that God brought. And God shows his power in this way. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, verse 20, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Which brings us to the ninth plague, which is as far as we're going to go this morning. We'll save the final plague and talk about it next time. In the ninth plague, we read about darkness coming over the face of the land. Verse 21 of chapter 10, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. Re was the sun god of the Egyptians, worshipped every morning as the sun rose in the east. He was considered to bring the sun up, and as is the case in so many polytheistic and pantheistic cultures, the sun itself was worshipped as a god, as divine, as a source of life. And yet now God strikes his blow against the sun, as it were, for the Egyptians. Darkness covers the face of the land. You have to remember, of course, that there is no electric light, right? The best that the Egyptians have are, are little clay lamps, oil lamps with one little wick sticking out of them that might have lit a small space around them, and that's all they have. Plagued by darkness. Who is more powerful, God is saying? Is it your son? Is it your God, Ray? Or is it I, the Lord? God is showing his great power and his glory. And yet, even here, we see Pharaoh still in rebellion against God. Look at the end of chapter 10, verse 27. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. God destroys the Egyptians' conception of their idols. Which, incidentally, is a business that God is perennially at work at. He is perennially in the business of casting down the idols of our hearts. He does it now, even as he did it in the land of Egypt. The idols that you think you want, God will diligently show you have no real power. And sometimes the process of learning that is difficult and painful. These plagues show God's sovereignty over the deities of Egypt. They show God's power over the Egyptian magi, the, the religious men, the holy men, as it were, of the land of Egypt. They are humiliated over and over again in this power contest. They show God's sovereignty over the different spheres of life as well, don't they? These plagues show that God is sovereign over the supernatural. So when Moses and Aaron first go into the court of Pharaoh and they throw their staffs down and they become serpents and the magicians are able to mimic that in their own way, we read that, that the staff of Aaron ate up. <laughs> the serpent that had been the staff of Aaron ate up the, the serpents that the magicians created, right? This is a supernatural act. It shows that God is, is sovereign over even those things which have no natural explanation. He is sovereign over the waters. He is sovereign over the Nile River. He is sovereign over the earth itself. He is sovereign over the economy. The cattle and the crops of the Egyptians are decimated. Don't miss that. By the end of the ninth plague, the economy of Egypt is in shambles. Their, 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 their livestock are dead. Their crops are gone. They have nothing. He is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign even over time. <laughs> Put yourself in the place of those Egyptians during that ninth plague of darkness. They have no smart watches or smartphones that will automatically tell them the time. The only way that, that people told time in the, ancient, in the ancient world was by the position of the sun. They couldn't tell night from day during this plague. God is sovereign over time. These plagues are meant to put God's glory on display. There is no area of life that is not under God's control. This is the one thing that we need most in the world, is to know and to delight in the glory of God. There's a danger associated with ignoring God's glory. Pharaoh routinely ignores God's sovereign glory in these stories, doesn't he? 
In fact, I think you notice several phases that Pharaoh goes through as these plagues progress. In phase one, Pharaoh convinces himself that the magicians are just as powerful. And so in those first couple of plagues, the magicians are able to mimic in some way. And, and commentators argue about whether he, he, they're able to mimic those plagues through actual dark arts, demonic power of some kind, or whether it's just through illusion and trickery. But it doesn't really matter where you fall on that question. The, the point is, Pharaoh sees their mimicry of those plagues as reason to ignore Moses and Aaron, right? And so... First of all, Pharaoh convinces himself that the magicians are just as powerful. And in phase two, Pharaoh ignores the clear evidence that the magicians are not as powerful. So even after, the magicians are no longer able to mimic the plagues. And in the plague of boils, when the magicians are roundly humiliated by themselves being afflicted by the plague, still, Pharaoh convinces himself that there must be good reason, and he chooses to ignore the fact that they're not as powerful. In phase three, Pharaoh attempts to bargain his way out of his dilemma. Glance back at chapter 8, verse 25 for just a second. Exodus 8, 25, Pharaoh calls Moses in and he says, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. You see, Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, you know what, maybe it's time to open these negotiations after all. Right? You can, you can sacrifice to your God, but do it within the land of Egypt. And, and of course, Moses refuses that negotiation. But, but you see this, this progression in Pharaoh's mind where he says, well, maybe I can bargain my way out of this hole that I've dug for myself. In phase four, we see Pharaoh practicing what amounts to a false repentance. Look at Exodus 9, verses 27 and 28. On the, on the heel of the plague of hail, when the crops of Israel are almost entirely destroyed. Whatever is left is about to be eaten by the locusts. Pharaoh calls Moses in. This is Exodus 9, 27. Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You shall stay no longer. I don't know. For all we know, maybe there is some sincere regret on Pharaoh's part here, some sincere sadness about what has happened to the land, maybe even a recognition uh, that what he's saying is true, that he has sinned. And yet his actions prove that this is no true repentance. It's false repentance. Pharaoh continues on and he blinds himself to the truth. He gives himself wholly to unrepentance and ultimately to death. In 1027, we read, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And he says to Moses in, in 1028, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. From the day you see my face, you shall die. This is the progression that Pharaoh goes through. Would you say that there at the end of chapter 10, Pharaoh is in, a, is in a place to hear the truth anymore? Is he in a place of a softened heart? No. If anything, he is, he is confirmed in his rebellion. This is the danger of ignoring the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, I think we see parallel habits even in our own hearts when it comes to how we respond to sin and God's correction. We often convince ourselves that God will not really punish sin. We mimic Pharaoh in that way. By con the way he convinced himself that the magicians were just as powerful, that he had nothing to fear from Moses and Aaron. We sometimes convince ourselves that we have nothing to fear from God's judgment. We convince ourselves that since we haven't seen God punish our sins up to this point, that he never will. Like Pharaoh, we often attempt to strike bargains with our sin. We attempt to negotiate our way out. We say, well, I'll give up this sin, but not that sin. Or I'll give myself up to you this much, Lord, but no further. All right? I'll submit myself just this much to your will. But don't ask too much of me. Right? We make bargains. We negotiate. We also can, can fall into the habit or into the danger of false repentance. You say, well, how do we know? How do we know what is false repentance and what is true repentance? Well, ultimately, the, the proof is in the result, right? What result do you see from it? Pharaoh, quote unquote, repented, I have sinned, right? But his 
grief over his sin was not occasioned by the work of God in his heart, and it didn't lead to the fruit of the Spirit in his actions. What does the Scripture tell us? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7 that godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. You see, at the beginning, false repentance and true repentance might look an awful lot alike. They look like sorrow over sin, grief over hurt that we've caused. But true godly repentance that is born in our heart by the work of the Holy Spirit will result in a life that is changed by the glory of God. It will result in a life that is lived in, in, in concert with the Spirit of God. What you see in Pharaoh might be, I don't know if it really is or if he's just talking, but what you see in Pharaoh might be an actual grief over the things that he sees around him. It might be an actual grief even over his sin, but it most certainly is not the result of a man who has seen the glory of God and chosen to delight in it. What is real repentance? It is a heart that has seen the glory of God in the face of Christ and fallen on its knees in obedience to him. We have to watch out for false repentance and give ourselves to true repentance. God may perhaps grant repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The alternative is that we, like Pharaoh, might begin to willfully blind ourselves and eventually get to the point where we couldn't see even if we wanted to. The one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. We need God to break into our lives and remind us of His power and glory. We need a power display in our own lives, like we read about God's power display here in the land of Egypt. We need to be reminded of just how infinitely worthy and satisfying God is. And sometimes the process of that involves the destruction of our idols, which is painful but it's what we need. The one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. There's a danger that comes from ignoring the glory of God, and, and there is an equal and even greater joy that comes in learning to delight in the glory of God. We, not, we must learn to delight in the glory of God. And I, th I can anticipate here a couple of questions that a person might ask as we talk about delighting in the glory of God. And the first question is this, why isn't it enough for me simply to acknowledge God's power and glory? Why, why, preacher, do you insist that we have to learn to know and delight in God's glory? Why can't I just know it? Why can't I just acknowledge God's power and glory? And the answer is the difference between Pharaoh and the Israelites. Pharaoh came to a point where he was able to acknowledge God's power and glory, but friends, he takes no delight in him. Or we could speak in terms of the demons. Scripture tells us that the demons acknowledge God's power and glory. In fact, if we are right in our understanding that demons are fallen angels, which I think is accurate, then we might even say demons acknowledge the glory of God and understand the glory of God better than you or I do. But do they delight in the glory of God? It is not enough for us simply to acknowledge the glory of God. We must take joy in God's glory. We must delight in God's glory. Consider it this way. A person can acknowledge that someone of the opposite sex is beautiful or handsome or kind or generous or brilliant or whatever descriptor catches your fancy. A person can acknowledge that without delighting in it, the delight comes in the marriage relationship. That's the difference here. It's relationship. Do we delight in who God is? Or do we simply acknowledge it from afar? That's a question that I challenge you to ask yourself. Do you delight in who God is? Or do you simply recognize truths about Him? The difference is life and death. Another question that I might anticipate with regard to this idea of learning to delight in God's glory is, why can't I delight rather in God's love than in His glory? Someone might say to me, I find it easier to delight in God's love. God's love 
is easier for me to wrap my mind around. It's, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. I like it. It makes me feel happy. I'd rather delight in God's love than in God's glory. And my response is, good, then we're on the same page. God's love and God's glory are the same thing. They are the same thing. Never distinguish between them. The doctrine of God's love and the doctrine of God's glory teach us these things. If we, if we read the, the doctrines of the faith, one of the things that we come across is the doctrine of God's simplicity. That God does not possess his attributes, that he is his attributes. God doesn't possess love, he is love. God doesn't possess glory, he is glory. And when you think about it in those terms, you realize that everything God is, he is to its full. His love is his glory, is his power, is his sovereignty, is his omnipotence, is his omniscience. Everything that God is, he is in its entirety. You cannot love his love without loving his glory. Nor can you delight in his glory without simultaneously delighting in his love. If you find his love easier to think about, fine. Think about it and glorify him for his love. And the more you... This is my challenge to you. The more you find yourself delighting in the love of God for you, the more you will find yourself rejoicing in the glory of God. When the scripture speaks to us of the glory of God, it phrases the glory of God consistently in the language of love and grace and mercy. In Ephesians, as we've been studying on, in our Sunday school hour on Sunday mornings, we read these words. In love... He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. Paul unites in the same breath these ideas that what God does for us in love and salvation is for his glory. In other words, God, in demonstrating his glory, demonstrates it precisely in his love. Or Ephesians 3. Verses 14 and following. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ. I know it's a long sentence. It's Paul. What do you want me to do about it? His point is, in order for you to know God's glory, you have to know his love. They're one and the same. They can't be separated. Or think about Moses himself. (laughs) A few chapters later on in this book, when they're in the wilderness, and Moses is having one of his crisis times with the Lord, and he says, Lord, show me your glory. Do you remember his question? Show me your glory. And what does Moses experience? God passes in front of him and he hears the words announced, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. When Moses asks to see the glory of God, God says, I am a God of love. His love and his glory are the same thing. Contrast that with the false deities of the Egyptians. These weak playthings that had, that had spheres of influence, that had to be appeased with human sacrifices and all kinds of things, just so that a little water might come out of the Nile to water the crops, just to keep the hail at bay. Contrast this with the gods of, of, of false religions all around us who are known as in their power and knowledge. But our God says, if you want to know me, know that I am a God abounding in steadfast love. This is a God who, in order to show his glory, in order to show his glory, demonstrates it in the greatest act of love of all. That's what the gospel is, isn't it? That's what the cross work of Christ is about. It's God demonstrating his glory. God demonstrating his love. Yes. God is demonstrating his glory and his love in the work of Christ. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest demonstration of the glory and the love of God. God becomes man, dies on the cross, taking your sin and mine, paying the penalty for it, rises from the dead, showing his triumph over sin and the penalty for sin and death and hell and Satan, ascends to the throne of heaven and promises to come back and spend eternity with us. And we will spend eternity basking in the love which is the glory of God. The one thing that we need most in the world is to know and delight in the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, can you delight in the glory of God on these terms? Can you take pleasure in God's glorious love and grace? Take a moment and reflect on that. Ask God to give you a a spirit-inspired delight in his glory, in his love. And in in just one minute, we're going to continue our worship by joining one another in celebrating the Lord's Supper.